Thank you. You may be seated. My weekly exercise. Again, once, uh, once again, we are delighted to have Brother Ken Olson with us. Tonight he'll be talking about treasures. We got some promises in God's word, and I trust that it will be a great blessing to us. Brother Olson, preach the word. Well, it's a pleasure to sing those hymns. In Brazil, those hymns are disappearing uh, very fast. Uh, in the United States, too, but especially in Brazil. There's Presbyterian churches there in Brazil that don't sing any hymns anymore. All they sing are modern choruses, contemporary music, and uh, most every church down there has cut back on the hymns, and they have more and more contemporary music and less and less hymns. And so it's always a joy to sing a lot of hymns. Well, turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6 and starting with verse 19. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 19. Here are some familiar scriptures here from the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 6, 19. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The light of the body is the eye, if therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness. Let's bow in prayer, O Lord. We pray that thou would open up thy word to us this evening. Help us to learn much from thy word. Help that all that we say might be according to thy word. And help us to lay up treasures as thou would have us to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're going to be talking about treasures tonight. We're not talking about spiritual treasures, the Word of God, uh, the treasures uh, like that that we have here on this earth. But we're talking about physical treasures on this earth and treasures so far as rewards in heaven. And you know, everybody wants to have treasures. Oh, the whole world is running after treasures. Everybody wants to get rich. They want these treasures. Hollywood never ceases to put out movies about treasures, about people searching for treasure and going high and low and doing everything and finally getting the great treasure at the end. They have all the movies like Treasure Island, The Treasure of the Sierra Madre. We have uh, National Treasure, all these different movies, all these things of the world, and books as well, that are about getting treasures. Well, you know, in our scripture right here, it talks about lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth. You know, just as I was on my way here to speak here in uh, Collingswood this morning, uh, we were driving up through Delaware, and lo and behold, there was a billboard right there as we were driving up, and it has a changeable uh, billboard with the numbers, and they put up how many million dollars is the lottery in Delaware. And this morning, it was up to $39 million. Well, everybody wants to know how many million dollars is the lottery, because everyone is searching after treasures. But you know, the Bible says that we as Christians should not be seeking after physical treasures of this earth. And we shouldn't be keeping those treasures as well. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. What is a treasure to begin with? What is a treasure? If you have a, a photograph of your mother, and you treasure that photograph, is, is that what we're talking about here? That photograph that you treasure, that's your treasure? No. Here we're talking about treasures that are worth money, that are worth 
money to sell, uh, something that's valuable in money, treasures. And we're not supposed to lay these up on earth. And it gives us one reason there in this verse is because they corrupt. They fly away. And here it gives us the three main ways the treasures fly away. You know, something that I like to collect and have collected for many years is books. And, uh, you know, books, uh, the two enemies of books are right here. Moth and rust. Insects and water. And those humidity, water, and insects will corrupt and destroy your books, will destroy uh, treasures that you have. And also, if you have things like gold and silver that moth and rust can't corrupt, well, thieves will break through and steal the gold and silver and things like that. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Let's go over to 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 9, just for a minute. Keep your finger here in uh, Matthew chapter 6, but 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 9. And this, is, I think, is a, an interesting scripture that has much application to what treasures are and what we should be doing. Even though it doesn't really talk here about treasures, as per se, we have 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 9. It's talking about women and the way women dress. And it says, In like manner also, that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array. Now here we have a principle in this verse dealing with the dress of the women as to uh, treasures and what we should be doing so far as our possessions and the things that we have. And here it's talking about their clothes, the apparel that they have. And here it says they are supposed to have modest apparel as opposed to costly array. Not with costly array, not with gold or pearls and all these treasures, the women are not supposed to be arrayed, but with modest apparel. And that really is the key meaning of modest in this verse, is not fancy, not gaudy, not showy. Uh, not luxurious, modest as opposed to costly array. Well, you ever hear of a modest house, a modest income? Well, that's the use of the word, as we have it right here, and that's what we should have. Going back to Matthew chapter 6, we should have things that are modest. A modest home, a modest car, a modest a dress modestly in modest clothes. We should have modest things, not luxurious, not showy, not for showing off. And that's one of the things that we should do in not having treasures on this earth, have modest possessions. But it says here, verse 20, back to Matthew chapter 6, But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. So we're not supposed to lay up treasures on this earth, but we're supposed to lay up treasures in heaven. Now, we can't have our cake and eat it too. A lot of Christians think they can have their cake and eat it too. They can have be laying up treasures here on this earth and laying up treasures in heaven at the same time. No, it's, a, it's actually an either-or here. It's either we have our treasures here or we have our treasures in heaven. And that's, you can see that especially in the next verse, verse 21. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And if we do have treasures on this earth... Our heart is going to be in those treasures here. You can just mark it down. Where your treasures is, there your heart will be also. And a lot of 
uh, Christians get that order confused in this verse. It says, first of all, where the treasure is, there is your heart. And Christians say, well, you know, I have some treasures on this earth. I have a lot of things, and God has blessed me, and I'm going to, meant to enjoy all these treasures that I have, but my heart's in heaven. Well, it can't be that way. If we have treasures on this earth, our heart is going to be there with those treasures here on this earth. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And so what is a treasure? It's much more than we need, much more than what we need. It's things that are not modest, but much more than what we need. Of course, you can't give a, an exact a definition of exactly how many dollars and cents that is, but it's a principle to use in our lives that we shouldn't have much more than what we need. We ought to live modestly with modest possessions. And here it says, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. How do we lay up treasures in heaven? We lay up treasures in heaven by giving in offerings to the work of the Lord, giving in offerings to the poor, so far as money is concerned. We also can lay up treasures in heaven by doing things for the Lord and serving Him with our whole heart and mind and soul and body. We can be laying up treasures in heaven. And that's what we're supposed to be doing. Not laying up treasures, not guarding treasures on this earth. Much more than what we need. Well, let's go on here. It says in verse 22, the light of the body is the eye. And you know the Bible talks about the lust of the eyes. And the lust of the eyes is covetousness. And people always want more and more and more and more. Remember this morning, I mentioned that my two-year-old grandson's favorite word is more. He wants more candy. He wants more playing. He wants more being outside. He wants more. And that's how it is with adults, with people. They want more treasures, more things, just a little bit more all the time. Uh, a story was, has often been recounted about Rockefeller, who was exceedingly rich, and I don't know if it's a true story or not. It sounds kind of apocryphal, but it might have been true. And supposedly they asked him one day, Rockefeller, how much money does it take to make you happy? How much money does it take? And Rockefeller answered, just a little bit more than what I have. It's always a little bit more. The Bible tells us that he that loves silver will never be satisfied with silver. He'll never be satisfied. He always wants more and more and more and more. Well, then we go on here. Verse 23. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that in thee is, dark, is darkness, how great is that darkness. And so if we have an eye that is covetous, always wanting more and more and more, uh, we're walking in darkness. Well, let's go on in this passage, verse 24. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or either he will hold the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, or yet for your body, what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, and the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you by taking thought can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall, not, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? And so here we continue on about treasures. And then it goes on to say here, no man can serve two masters. Nobody can serve God and money. 
We can't have two masters in our life. We can't have two things that are first in our life. Idols are things that take the place of God. And God has to have first place in our life. We have to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind. And we have to put Him first. The trouble is, so many people in this world, even Christians, uh, put money first in their lives. The making of money, the getting of things, getting more, more, more. And we can't love both money and the Lord. And then it goes on here, verse 25, it says, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, or yet for your body, what ye shall put on. And so it's interesting here, it says, take no thought. It does, that's not to be taken exactly like that, that we're never supposed to think about the future, about our needs, or what we're going to do. But here it's in the sense of worry. We're not supposed to worry about things in the future. We're not supposed to worry about what we're going to eat, what we're going to drink, what we're going to put on for raiment. Of course, here it talks about the basic needs of man, eating, drinking, and clothing. Uh, we in America today, we're much past that, uh, way past the basic needs of food, cl food and clothing. The Bible says, having food and clothing, let us be there with content. Uh, we're way past that, and we want all kinds of things, boats and cars and houses and, and all kinds of big things, vacation homes and and anything you can imagine is what people want. And uh, uh, but and people worry about those things also, whether they're going to get those things or not. But we're not supposed to worry about those things. And you know, people worry about what's going to happen. What if this happens? What if that happens? What if the other thing happens? And people just go uh, practically insane worrying about the future. It says, take no thought. And what do people do when they're worried about the future? Who are people trusting in to take care of them? Even Christians many times. We should be trusting in the Lord to take care of us for all of these needs that we have. And notice these are needs and not wants. Uh, again, just as we were mentioning this morning, this morning we were mentioning that the preacher should pr preach what the people need, not what they want. And God promises to give us not all that we want, but all that we need, and particularly our basic necessities. Well, people that are worrying about everything, they're not trusting in God to give them everything, and they're not trusting in God to provide for them if this happens or if that happens or if the other thing happens. No, they trust in the government. They trust in the government to take care of them. Uh, we have a real uh, culture of dependency in the United States. And that's why it's so difficult to have a good candidate elected for president because half the population is dependent on the government. And they're trusting in the government to take care of them, to supply their needs, to, to answer uh, their worries. Uh, just like here in New Jersey, I'll submit to you that, uh, you know, that the hurricane came through here and FEMA came in and paid everybody for all the damages of the hurricane. Well, you know, there was the government taking care of the people. The government really, I believe, has no business taking care of people uh, when things like hurricanes happen. That's not the government's business. But we have the people trusting in the government, trusting in the government to take care of them. And also, they're trusting in insurance to take care of them. And people are worried about what if this happens, what if that happens, and they keep on taking thought for the morrow, and so they get insurance on this and insurance on that, and the insurance on, they get insurance on anything you could possibly imagine. They get insurance for their life, insurance for their health, insurance for their car, insurance for their house, insurance for the flood, insurance for, for cancer, insurance for uh, just, you can just, anything they're afraid of is what people get insurance for. And I, I believe that insurance is not sin to have, but we shouldn't overdo the insurance. And, you know, of course, God can use some insurance to take care of us, but 
people are trusting way too much in their insurance and using too much of their money for the insurance and for, of course, they're using too much of their money to have the government take care of them because the government is taking so much in taxes. Well, what if this and what if that? But it says, Take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink. And the Lord's going to take care of us. We don't have to worry about things, and we don't have to trust in other things like the government and our insurance. And then verse 26. Behold, the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? And so then... Uh, we have in this passage how God takes care of the birds, he takes care of the flowers, and as God takes care of all the things of nature, God's going to take care of us as Christians. We just have to trust in him. We don't have to worry about things. And we don't have to have big treasures in case this happens or in case that happens. No, God is going to take care of us. And, I mean, we can prepare for the future. We can have some modest amount of, of uh, savings to take care of us. But when it goes past modest and it goes to treasures to take care of us, well, then that's a problem. And, you know, here it says, Behold the fowls of the air. They sow not, and yet the Lord takes care of them. That reminds me of Leo Tolstoy, the famous Russian author. And he quotes this verse right here in his book, War and Peace. And in War and Peace, there's a man there that's on his deathbed, and they're all worried about what's going to happen to his children after he dies. And on his deathbed, he said, well, God takes care of the fowls, and he's going to take care of my children. And he quotes this verse. Another good uh, uh, short story that Tolstoy wrote on the subject of treasures he wrote a short story by the name of How Much Land is Enough? How Much Land is Enough? And in that story, this man there in Russia, he was supposed to buy a piece of property. And, and in Russia, the land was so vast there, there in the interior of Russia, that they sold the property not by the acre, not by not by even the square mile, but they sold the property by the day. By the day. However much property you could walk around, get around, in one day and come back to your starting point, you could have all that property for the set price. So the story has this man, he goes there to get this property, and so he starts out early in the morning, he goes on and on, and, he, and he's always seeing, oh, that looks like a nice area, and he goes around now, and he goes to another one, that looks like a nice area, and he goes on and on, and then it gets late in the day, and he can't hardly make it back, and so he's hurrying and hurrying and running and running to get back in time, so he can get back and have all that property, and he makes it back right as the sun's going down, and... He falls dead right on the spot from sheer exhaustion. And then Tolstoy concludes at the end of the story, how much land is enough? Well, six feet is enough. Six feet, just enough to bury us in. And you know, people, they want more and more and more. That guy wanted more and more and more land, covetous. And we're not supposed to lay up treasures on this earth but lay up treasures in heaven. And then it has in verse 27, Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? It's interesting. I uh, was reading, or I had somebody read in the NIV this verse recently, and they completely changed this verse. They make it, Which of you, by taking thought, can add one minute to his lifetime? And, uh, of course, the NIV is way off from the Greek and from the Hebrew, and we can trust in the King James Version. We can trust that it's accurate according to the Greek and Hebrew which God gave. And so it goes on here and talks about the lilies of the field, that God clothes, clothes them, and he's going to clothe us. He's going to take care of us. Let's look over at Luke chapter 12 for a couple of minutes. Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12, on this same subject of treasures. Luke chapter 12 and verse 13. 
Luke chapter 12 and verse 13. And one of the company said unto him, Master, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. And he said unto him, Man, who made me a judge or a divider over you? Well, you know, there's always a lot of trouble with inheritances. Uh, in our own families, we have trouble with the inheritance in Brazil. We have trouble with the inheritance here in the United States. And uh, there's always troubles. Uh, usually one member of the family takes the lion's share of the inheritance, and the rest of the family uh, want their fair share. And uh, there's all kinds of troubles, all over money, all over covetousness. Uh, people are covetous. They want those that big uh, wad of cash, big wad of property that's left to them from their parents. Well, Jesus goes on to talk about these treasures after he was asked that question about dividing the inheritance, and he refused to divide the inheritance. He said, who made me a judge or a divider? Well, verse 15, and he said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the, in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast prepared, provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself, and is not rich toward God. So this question about inheritance led to Jesus saying, be careful. Take heed and beware of covetousness. This morning, we had our message about beware of wolves. Jesus here is talking about beware of covetousness. Covetousness is insidious. It creeps up on you when you're not looking, and we become more and more covetous. Beware of covetousness. For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. And of course, in our world around us, a person who has a lot of money, well, he's looked on as somebody that's successful. And somebody that doesn't have much money, well, he's looked on as somebody that's not successful. Someone that has a big job that pays big money, well, they're looked on as successful. And someone that doesn't have a very good job, they're not successful. Well, Jesus here, he says, a man's life does not consist in the abundance of the things which he possesses. And God's not interested in what we have, but what we are. And if we're serving him with our whole heart and mind and soul and body. And then he gives a parable here about treasures here. And you know, I think most people approach, approach this parable as being about an unsaved person. But I think it could be either saved or unsaved in this parable. This rich man, whose ground brought forth plentifully. He got all kinds of things from his crops, and he was, was having so much crop, so many crops that he couldn't put them in his barns. Brought forth plentifully. And then he goes on to say within himself, verse 17, and notice that this rich man, he's really wrapped up with himself. He says, what shall I do because I have no room to bestow my fruits? And he said, this will I do. I will pull down and my, pull down my barns and I will and build greater and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, Thou hast much goods laid up for many years. 
Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. Well, this guy, he had a problem. He had all those crops, all those abundant crops. He had nowhere to put them, so he built up bigger and bigger barns to put all those crops in and all those things that he had. And he said, well, I have much goods laid up for many years. He didn't have a modest amount of things. He had much, much more than what he needed. Of course, he could have said, well, what if this happens? What if that happens? I'm prepared for all eventualities. You know, I'm getting up to uh, retirement age now, uh, at least thereabouts, even though there's a lot of people much older than me around here. But uh, I could start getting Social Security next year. And so I'm looking at those things a little bit. And, you know, uh, on the... Uh, uh, news and on the web and wherever. They like to bandy about the figure of one million dollars is the right amount of money to have for retirement. And therefore you are prepared for all eventualities. Well, is that a modest amount to have laid up for retirement? Uh, well, I don't really think so. I don't think that's quite in the modest ballpark. But here we have people want to provide for anything that could possibly happen to them for the eventuality they might live to be a hundred years old. They want to have everything provided for and lay up much treasure for many years. Well, what did Jesus say about that? He said, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee, then whose shall those things be? which thou hast provided. And yet the problem is, we could die today. We could die tomorrow. And if we've laid up all those big treasures to provide for us for uh, many, many years in advance, well, you know what? We could die and leave all that to someone else and we won't have that treasure in heaven. Beside the fact that while we had that treasure on this earth, we were setting our heart on it. Because where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. You know, today is a real selfie culture. Everybody wants to be taking selfies. As we were driving here into Collingswood this morning, here was a, a couple there with a bicycle, and they were there taking a selfie of themselves. People have these poles that they carry around to take better selfies. A few years ago, there was no such thing as a selfie. But we got the selfie culture today. People are focused on themselves. Just as this rich man here was focused on himself. What shall I do? My barns, my fruits, my goods. And you know, we're just caretakers of the things that we have. We're do we just have our things for a few years. Our house, our property, we have it for a few years. And somebody else is going to have it soon. We're just taking care of it for a little while. You know, the Bible is very clear that it teaches personal property. It teaches, I believe, capitalism. And, you know, it's good to have private property. It's good to work for a living. And, you know, I'm not saying that nobody should ever have a good business. Nobody should ever make a lot of money. That's all right if we make a lot of money. But if we make a lot of money, we can't keep that as a treasure here on this earth. We have to use it for the Lord and give it to the Lord's work and, and lay up treasures in heaven if we happen to make a lot of money. It's not as some people think, well, God has prospered me and I've made a lot of money and I'm rich now and, and God just wants me to enjoy that. But that's not, that's not what God word, God's word says. He says, lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth. And we can come up with a lot of excuses why we have these big treasures. A lot of excuses about what if this or what if that, and we're prepared for everything. But we need to be laying up treasures in heaven. We can have a modest amount to provide for the future, but it should be modest, a modest amount. And it says in that last verse, it is clear about that, that this is talking about treasures. So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Let's go back over to Matthew chapter 6, the last part of that chap 
chapter there, Matthew chapter 6, and verse 31. The conclusion of Matthew chapter 6 here of this subject. Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? Wherewithal shall we be clothed? What if we grow, uh, live to be a hundred years old? What if I get cancer? What if uh, a hurricane comes? What if that? What if that? What if the other thing? No. Take no thought. Don't worry about those things. God's going to take care of us. Verse 22, or verse 32. For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. God knows what we need. He's going to provide for our needs. Not our wants, but our needs. And the world is seeking after all these things. The world is all worried about what if this happens and what if that happens. The world is all about laying up treasures. Uh, that's their chief goal in life, is to lay up treasures, to have a big treasure and take their ease, their ease, eat, drink, and be merry, or have much goods laid up for many years. But that shouldn't be our goal. The Bible says, labor not to be rich. Labor not to be rich. We might have a business, and we might get rich through that business, get a lot of money through that business, but then we need to use that for the Lord, and that shouldn't be our goal in our business, to get rich. Our goal should be to serve the Lord, to do what we ought to do, and hopefully the Lord will prosper us. And then we use what we get for his honor and his glory, and not for laying up treasures on this earth. And then verse 33, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. And so the first thing we need to do is be serving the Lord, and laying up treasures in heaven, seeking his kingdom. And he's going to supply all our needs. He's going to take care of us if this happens or if that happens or if the other thing happens. He's going to take care of us. Verse 34, Take therefore no thought for the morrow. For the morrow shall take thought for the thing of its, things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. And... The Lord knows what we need. He's going to take care of us. Take no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. So our goal is not to be rich. Our goal is not to have a big treasure here on this earth. Our goal is to have things modestly on this earth, modest amount of this and that and the other things, modest, modest preparations for the future, but not luxurious not fancy, uh, not costly array as with the women. We're not supposed to be laying up treasures on this earth, but laying up treasures in heaven. Let's bow in prayer. O oh Lord, we thank Thee for Thy goodness unto us. We thank Thee for Thy word. And O oh Lord, help us not to be laying up treasures on this earth. Help us to lay up treasures in heaven. Help us to be serving Thee as we should be. In Jesus' name, amen. That was a wonderful challenge. How important it is to focus on eternal things. Set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth, for you are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. It's the theme of many of the epistles in the New Testament. John writes in 1 John chapter 2, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passes away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. I hope you noticed I left out one phrase in there. It's one that's focused on in this text. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. It's pretty blunt. Things of earth pass away. The word of God stands forever. The things of earth, we're not owners, we're merely stewards. It doesn't belong to us, it's a stewardship to use for Christ. 
Along that thought, let's take our hymnals and turn to number 554, Take the World, But Give Me Jesus. 554, we'll stand and sing all four verses. <laughs> 